to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin. This is the gospel of Christ to proclaim good news unto the poor. The gospel of Christ, spreading the soul-saving message of Jesus. And now, Ben Bailey. This is the gospel of Christ. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and breathed his last. Mark chapter 15, verse number 37. We welcome you today to our study of the final days in the life of Jesus from the Gospel of Mark. We're thinking today about Mark chapters 13 through 16, and these moments will usher us into some of the most powerful moments in the history of the world where our Lord and Savior goes to the cross for each one of us. We hope you'll join with us as we're going to think about the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, and even his power over death. We're so glad that you've joined us for our study today. As always, we want you to know that today's lesson is being brought to you by individual Christians and congregations of the Church of Christ. The Lord's Church in your local area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly. Whether that be on Sunday for worship or Wednesday for Bible study, you would be an honored guest at any of their assemblies. You'll find people there who love God, who love others, and who are deeply concerned about the souls of men and women. Friend, if you've got a Bible question, maybe you're wondering about salvation or the church or, or any number of religious uh, matters, you'll find people in the Lord's church in your local area who'd be happy to sit down and study the Word of God with you in kindness and love and look at the truth of God's Word. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ, we'd love to help you in your desire to know God better. We encourage you to check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can access all our lessons. They're available to you free of charge. In fact, if you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our lessons, just go to our website, fill out a media request form. We'd be happy to make that available to you as a digital download or other formats if you need that as well. And friend, we want to encourage you also to check us out on Facebook, like our Facebook page, follow us on that. Great way to keep up with things that we're doing. And then, of course, in our fast-paced world today, where everybody's got a smartphone, we want to encourage you to check out the Gospel of Christ app that's available in the respective Play Stores. You can get it there, and it's a great way to keep up with our new lessons, what we're doing, and just so that you can know how we're trying to spread the Gospel and reach people with the news of Jesus Christ. And as always... We want to thank you today for joining us for our study. Hope you've got your Bible ready. Let's look to the Word of God together. Mark chapter 13, we are now introduced to some of the final teaching of Jesus. As he enters into Jerusalem, he approaches the temple, and his disciples will say to him, in essence, wow, Lord, look at this magnificent temple. And Jesus will say, do you see this temple? Not one stone's going to be left upon another. And they're taken back by that. And Jesus begins to talk to them about the destruction of the temple, about the end of the Jewish age, and ultimately about the end of all things and the second coming of the world. And so here we hear about God's power even in the kingdom and that old Jewish system and temple which they looked up to wasn't going to last forever. Now, is there some language in Mark 13 and Matthew 24 that's a little bit apocalyptic and hard to understand in some ways? Well, there is. But look in Matthew, the parallel passage. I want you to hold your finger in Mark 13, and I want you to flip back to Matthew 24, which is the parallel passage to it. And a big thing that we need to understand, to get this first bit of language in Matthew 24 and Mark 13 is, there's a great divide in the context. Look at Matthew 24, verse number 34. Of everything Jesus said up to this point, which covers a great deal in Mark chapter 13, listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 24, 34. Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away, and notice the adverb of time, until all these things 
take place. A generation would be a, a, a life of an individual. We're talking about max, 100 years, but some of these people are older, 30, 40 years old probably. So we're talking about in a generation of time, a definite period of time. Jesus said, these things are going to happen within this generation. And so when we hear about that language in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, and we hear the coming of the Lord, we're talking about the Lord's coming like it was in the book of Isaiah, where God came with power and he dealt with the nations. His will was accomplished. He took out kings and kingdoms. He put up new kings and kingdoms. He's taking out that old Jewish temple and Jewish system, and he's establishing with eternality his kingdom, his powerful kingdom today. And so it is in Mark 13 and Matthew 24, much of what's said is about the end of the Jewish temple, the Jewish system, the, the Romans coming in during the destruction of Jerusalem and annihilating that system. And, and it kind of finally, Hebrews 8 verses 12 through 13, finally and ultimately, it's ready to vanish away completely. And then in Matthew 24 verse 36, Mark 13, verse 32, we have the second coming of the Lord and the end of the world in totality. Look in Mark chapter 13 and notice what Jesus says about that day of the Lord in the final sense. Jesus says, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Now, Jesus had talked to them about that, that first segment that they were going to be watching for. You'll know when these signs are happening, when you see this, do this, pray that it's not on this day or when the gates are closed. And they told them when they could know before. Here's a stark contrast. But of that day, Lord, when's the temple going to be destroyed? When's this going to happen? When's the end of the world? And the world's different. Nobody knows the day or the hour of the second coming of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so God... God didn't tell us that, but we do know this. God's word's going to endure forever. Mark 13, 31, Matthew 24, verses 34 through 36. Heaven and earth will pass away. Yes, there is a day coming when this world is going to end at the second coming. Heaven and earth will pass away. God's word is what's going to endure the test of time. And so when we think about this life, and we think about the temporary nature of it. Friend, everything that's touchable, tangible, seeable now, heaven and earth is going to pass away. New heavens and new earth are going to be ushered in. Second Peter 3, verses 9 through 12. We'll have that promise of living with God in the place Jesus has gone to prepare. John 14, 1 through 6. But if it's the word of God that's going to endure, friend, that's where I need to put my hope. That's where I need to put my trust. That's what I need to live my life by. And so hearing all of this, what did Jesus want his immediate disciples to take home with them as a lesson? What's he want us to learn today? Friend, the Jewish system, destruction of Jerusalem, Israel, and that whole idea of passing away that really has no bearing per se on me as a Christian. But the end of the world, the second coming of Christ, the judgment of all things, that has a different bearing on all of us. What's the Lord want me to remember about that day? Well, here's what he wants. What he told his disciples, he still says to us today. Look in Mark chapter 13, and I want you to know what Jesus said, verse 35. Watch therefore, for you do not know when the master of the house is coming, in the evening, at midnight, at the crowing of the rooster, in the morning, lest coming suddenly he finds you asleep. In verse 37, what I say unto you, I say unto all, watch. Friend, the Lord wants me to be ready, to be watchful. I don't know if it's going to be in Nine o'clock, noon, or five o'clock. I don't know what day of the calendar it's going to be on. I don't know what year it's going to be. No man knows the day nor the hour except the Father. But here's what I can know. Just be ready always. Don't worry about the time. Don't worry about the day. Don't worry about the month or the year. Don't, don't get caught up in all that. Here's the remedy to all that. If you're ready once and you stay ready and you maintain being ready, it don't matter what day it is. It don't matter if it's 9 o'clock on a Tuesday 20 years from now. 
if you watch and you're ready, the day or the time don't matter. And so Jesus wants us always to be ready, to be watchful for when that day comes so that no matter when it is, we're ready for God to be here. Now in Mark chapter 14, 15, and 16, we're now going to enter into Jesus' preparation for his death, burial, and resurrection. Part of that preparation is that he's anointed by Mary for his burial. This lady, this woman, Mark chapter 14, Mary comes to Jesus and she, she anoints Jesus with this costly fragrant oil and, and, and wipes his feet with her hair. And, and the Bible tells us that this message is going to be told. It's a beautiful, touching scene where this woman out of love spends this much money and effort and, and goes to great detail to do that. And, and some, especially Judas, they're kind of upset about this. Why was this money not, why was this bottle of perfume not taken and, and sold and the money given to the poor. And Jesus says, she did this in preparation for my burial. And I don't know how that event affected Jesus, but it, at this point, Judas now agrees to betray Jesus. Mark 14 verses 10 and 11, Judas goes to those who are going to betray Jesus and he will, is willing for a certain amount of money, for 30 pieces of silver. He agree, agrees to put that kiss on Jesus, identify who he is, and hand him over to the betrayers, to those who are going to give Jesus up. In Mark chapter 14, Jesus also celebrates the Passover with his disciples, as any Jew would have in that day. But in the process, he institutes the Lord's Supper, that which we remember today. He would say as they're at that supper and they gather around, as he passes that bread around, he would say, take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. As they had that drink, the fruit of the vine there, drink you all of it. This is my blood given, in, given for you uh, of the new covenant. He said, I'll not eat or drink this again until in the kingdom. And so when we think about what Christ did in this Passover event, and you remember the significance of that, right? The Passover represented God delivering Israel out of Egyptian bondage from the, the slavery under Pharaoh and heading them toward the promised land. And that Passover, the whole idea of the Passover was to remember and not forget that uh, for the Jews. My friend, as Jesus takes that Passover and institutes the Lord's Supper, we're reminded that there's one worse than Pharaoh that we're in slavery to. God be thanked that though you were the slaves of sin, we were in bondage to sin. Satan is an, a terrible taskmaster like a roaring lion, 1 Peter 5, 8. And yet the lamb, not the Passover lamb, the true Paschal lamb, the true Passover lamb, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ made a once for all sacrifice for the sins of the world. Hebrews 10, verse number 12. And as we remember his death, burial, and resurrection on the first day of the week, Acts 20, verse 7, we're reminded every time of what Jesus did for us. And Jesus reminds us of that as he institutes the Lord's Supper there at the Passover. Part of that scene in Mark chapter 14 is Jesus telling his disciples they're going to strike the shepherd and the sheep are going to be scattered. And Peter, you know, he'll speak up and he'll say, Lord, I don't care what happens. I don't care about who does what. I'll go with you. I'll even go with you to death. And Jesus says, Peter, in essence, he says, you're not, you're not what you think you are. He says, before the rooster crows, you'll deny me three times. And Peter, of course, he doesn't, he doesn't get all that right then and there. But as you read Matthew and Luke's account as well, Peter's out by the, in the courtyard where when Jesus has been taken captive and they come up to him and they say, hey, one servant girl says, hey, he's around the fire. Weren't you with him? No, 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 not me. Your speech betrays you. You say, oh, no, not me. And then he began to bring down curses on himself, to swear, to make oaths. I don't even know the man. And he remembered the words of Jesus. That rooster crowed and Peter wept bitterly. Reminds us that sometimes when we think we've got it all figured out, sometimes when we think we're bigger and better than we are, sometimes we put our trust in our ability and ourself, that leads to our downfall. 
instead of thinking I can do this, let's say, like the Apostle Paul, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians chapter 4, verse number 13. Now, I want you to see in Mark 14, Jesus' prayer in the garden. Look with me in Mark chapter 14. Notice beginning in verse 35. Jesus went a little further and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Then he came and found them sleeping and said to Peter, Simon, are you sleeping? Could you not watch one hour? Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. That prayer in the garden reminds us of, of several ideas about prayer. Number one, it reminds us that even Jesus, in the most difficult times, utilized the power of prayer. Father, if it's possible, the plan of God was for it not to be. And Jesus, Jesus in his heart of heart knew that. But anybody facing that situation would definitely not want to go through the physical pain. Let this cup pass from me. And then not, not, not thy will, not my will, but thine be done. And then he'd asked his disciples, his disciples, you know, just stay here, stay awake with me, pray with me, let, let, let's get through this difficult moment. And every time he'd go away a little bit, he'd come back and they'd be asleep. Could you not watch and pray? And that reminds us of the, the need to make prayer a priority in our life. Maybe sometimes we, we struggle, we deal with temptation, we, we let sin rule in our life, we don't have the strength that we need because we're not watching and we're not praying like we ought to. I wonder if, if part of that problem is just that we let other things, instead of prayer and diligence, we let other things get in the way of our service to Almighty God. You've got in Mark chapter 14, as they are in the garden, Judas comes with that, that throng of scribes and, and the Pharisees and the high priest and the, the people there sent to enforce that. There's the betrayal and the arrest in the garden. Judas places that kiss on Jesus, identifies him. Jesus is taken there from them. He's before the Sanhedrin. You've got the events of Peter denying Jesus. And then watch what happens in Mark 15, verse 1. Look what Jesus allowed. Immediately in the morning, the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council. And listen to this. And they bound Jesus, led him away, and delivered him to Pilate. They bound the hands of our Lord and Savior, and they led him away. Now, did Jesus let that happen? You know he did. You read the accounts of the gospel. I mean, think about this. You've, we've seen the power throughout the book of Mark. Jesus had the power to cast out demons. Jesus had the power to raise the dead. Jesus had the power to heal people just with a word. He controlled the elements. Everything Jesus did illustrates that he allowed this. When they come to Jesus in the garden, they bind his hands, they arrest him, they take him to Pilate. Jesus willingly allowed men to bind his hands. Friend, how much does that say? Jesus said, do you not know that I could not call to the Father right now and bring down several legions of angels? It was possible. He didn't want to have to go through that suffering. Nobody would. Not something that he looked forward to in that sense, in the physical sense. But he willingly allowed himself to suffer for me and you. Why did he do that? Why the scourging? Why the mocking? Why the beating? Why allow himself to be bound? Why all of that? He was bruised for our iniquities, the prophet Isaiah says. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, we are healed. Jesus didn't do that for any crime he had committed. In fact, as you study the gospel accounts, Pilate will say, I'm going to release him. There's no reason. I'm just going to let him go. And they just, the multitude won't have it. They realized this was done out of envy and jealousy. And yet Jesus willingly committed no guile nor deceit found in his mouth. He did that for me and you. 
In fact, a common criminal. When Pilate wanted to release him in Matthew 27 and Mark chapter 15, a common criminal, Barabbas, was released in his place. One who had committed treason, murder, and a riot, that man was let go. And Jesus took Barabbas' place. You know, Jesus took my place too. Think about the suffering that our Lord went through in Mark 15. They take Jesus into the praetorium. The soldiers have their way with him. They, they hit him in the face. They take that crown of thorns and they place that on his head. They take the reed and they strike him with it. He's taken and Jesus is scourged. And a scourging, they would take Jesus very likely. There'd be a couple of ways. Might be his hands hung from the ceiling. His back might be stretched tight across uh, with some type of rope across a, a pole or something like that. And stripes were laid on his back over and over. Then they take that robe and they put it on Jesus and the robe adheres to the blood and it all dries. They rip that robe off again and everything starts all over. They take Jesus up the hill to Golgotha, Calvary. They nail his hands and feet to a cross. And as he's suspended between heaven and earth, for every breath that he takes in, he's got to put pressure on the nails in his feet. For every breath that he exhales, he's got to put pressure on the nails in his hand. Jesus hung there in agony and pain and suffering until he gave up his last for me and you. Listen to it again. 1 Peter 2.24 He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes we are healed. As Jesus struggled with every breath on the cross, as the life ran out of him. Why did he do that? For you? For me? See how much God loves you? Do you see how much God loves me? Do you see what salvation cost? A king on a cross. A greater power. What greater power could there be? We've talked in the book of Mark about the power and majesty of Jesus. What greater power could there ever be than to be up on a cross dying? Just like that, you could have come down and you had the power to stay up there and endure it. We wouldn't have done that. Only God can do that. Friend, that's power on display. And then in Mark chapter 15, Jesus dies on that cross. The Bible says, and he breathed his last. Hanging on that cross, he died for me and you. He's taken down from that cross, Mark chapter 15, buried in Joseph's tomb, tomb nobody had ever been laid in, but he doesn't stay in the tomb. Look at Mark 16 with me. The story does not end with Jesus dying. Mark 16, verse 1. Now when the Sabbath was past, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Siloam bought spices that they might come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But when they looked up, they saw the stone had been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a white robe, sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. Listen to this. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. What makes the story of Jesus, the gospel, so powerful? It's his life. It's his power. It's his majesty. It's the power of his death as well. My friend, the greatest power Jesus had is a power Nobody anywhere has ever possessed. No Roman leader, no Caesar, no ruler anywhere has this power. Up from the grave, Jesus arose. He is not here. He is risen. His power over death would be the greatest proof of the power of Jesus anytime, anywhere. And friend, that proof wasn't just made up. Who rolled away the stone? What'd they do with the body? 
They were watching it. They were watching it big time. Nobody's going to come in and steal this. In fact, they thought they might, so they prepared for that. What about all the people who come out of the graves? What about the veil of the temple being rent? What about the 500 people who saw Jesus at once, his disciples? 1 Corinthians 15. This wasn't done in the back corner somewhere. The proof of Jesus' resurrection is ungetoverable. And my friend, it is the most powerful proof of the majesty of Christ. Even death could not hold him. The final enemy was defeated. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 55, he arose from the grave, and as a result, that's the hope and the joy that we have as well. And so, my friend, as we've thought about the power of Jesus in the Gospel of Mark, hear what Jesus said for us to do, to be a follower of his and the mission he gave us. Jesus said in Mark 16, 15, go into all the world, preach the gospel unto every creature, he that believes and is baptized will be saved. He that does not believe shall be condemned. Have you obeyed your king? Have you obeyed the powerful majesty of Jesus today? Have you believed he's the son of God, John 8, 24? Have you repented of sin, Luke 13, verse 3? Have you confessed him before men, Matthew 10, 32 and 33? Have you been baptized? for the forgiveness of your sins, Acts 2.38. And then, friend, have you risen up out of that to walk in a newness of life and lived your life to tell others about Jesus, to love God, to love others, and to strive every day to get to heaven. Friend, if you're not a child of God, we urge you today to become one. If you are a Christian, keep fighting the fight. Keep pressing toward the goal. Don't ever give up. And we hope you'll join us next time as we study more from the Gospel of Christ. Today's closed captions are brought to you by Christian Family Bookstore in Chattanooga, Tennessee. We encourage you to visit thechristianfamilybookstore.com for all your Christian book needs. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the churches of Christ with its whole aim to take the Gospel to the whole world. We do that through TV, internet, free media, and streaming. Our motto truly is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world, and we believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious programs today, we're concerned about lost souls not your wallet. The gospel of Christ. Visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study materials, including audio and video of our lessons. Request your copy of today's lesson by completing a media request form online. On demand downloads are also available at thegospelofchrist.com. We would love to hear from you. Email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com or call 844 6 Gospel. You may also write us at the address on your screen. Search your app store for The Gospel of Christ to access our mobile app on your this smartphone. Is the gospel of Christ.